Welcome to Pro Revenge, where two out-of-line girlfriends get exactly what they deserve. Our first story comes from a throwaway account. In late May 2016, I asked my crush, Kate, of three years out on a coffee date. Three dates later, we made things official. For the next seven months, our relationship felt too good to be true. We clicked on so many interests, so we hardly ever disagreed on anything. We were very open with each other, which led to an incredible sex life. We both had good jobs, so we had money to spoil one another, and our families were both enthusiastic about our relationship. In January 2017, I was accepted into my country's Armed Forces Reserve Program as a combat engineer. I underwent basic training from February to late April, and was up until then the hardest thing I had ever done. There were several times I thought I wouldn't graduate, and the only thing that kept me going was Kate's words of encouragement over texts and calls. She was there when I received my BTC certificate, and never let me forget how proud she was of me. As part of my job in the reserves, I would have to go away in the summer for advanced training, between early June to late August. Kate fully supported me going 400 kilometers away to the training center and spending almost our entire summer break on work to further my military career. The summer was brutal on me. I was a social outcast from every clique that formed on our course and was the butt of several jokes. My self-esteem plummeted to the floor. But Kate's belief in me was what made me prevail. I passed his fifth best on course, and I owed it all to her. The Decline Things between us started to sour after returning home. According to her, I wasn't as spontaneous and outgoing as before I went away. I was dismissive, took small jabs and jokes as personal insults, and would rather stay in, watch movies, and have sex instead of going out. Unbeknownst to both of us, I had developed some nasty social anxiety due to the events of the summer, and it started to affect our relationship. Nearing our two-year anniversary in 2018, we got into a heated argument over a small misunderstanding and subsequently broke up. I was incredibly distraught before she texted me three days later and said she wanted to try and fix things. I didn't see her for three weeks, but we kept in touch every day, slowly mending things. When we officially got back together, nothing felt the same. Every time I talked with her, it was as if I was walking on eggshells and only worsened my anxiety, which in turn hurt our already damaged relationship. Then things finally came to a head at the end of July. The hurt. While in school, Kate had met a dude named John. She saw in John what she used to see in me, and they quickly became very close friends. He consoled her through our breakup and every little time I messed up afterwards. For the record, I knew of John, but never thought Kate would ever do anything with him. One night after work, we had planned for me to stay the night at Kate's place. I arrived to see the two of them chilling on the living room couch. Kate said that John had dropped by for a spontaneous visit, and he was just leaving. After John left, she became cold and distant. I slowly accepted that our relationship was dead and asked her how things were between us. She echoed my thoughts and we agreed to break up the next day. She said I could stay the night one last time, seeing how it was late and she was still worryful of me. From there on until she fell asleep, Kate became uncharacteristically glued to and protective of her phone. In the past, she wouldn't care if I glanced over to catch her and her friends texting about whatever, but now she did her best to hide the screen from me. I asked her about it and she said it was private stuff which only raised more questions. After she fell asleep, curiosity got the better of me. I unlocked her phone, I knew her passcode, and bound hundreds of messages between her and John. Messages about how she was now single, how exciting it was that they could now be a couple in public, and laughing at me about every little thing I did. I quietly sobbed as I read through each hurtful text. My crying wasn't as quiet as I thought. Kate stirred, and once she realized what I was doing, she threw a fit. I couldn't find the anger of words to combat her, so I just grabbed my stuff and left, with Kate shouting and yelling at me the whole time. It was late in the morning when I got home. I just broke down and ugly cried all night. I called in sick from work the next day and spent it sulking in my bed. The day after, I got several angry texts from Kate's friends and family, and a bid to save her image and denounce anything I might say about her, she told anyone she knew that I had forced myself upon her that night in one last attempt to get some before we broke up, and left after the deed was done. Though what I had done was scarring, she refused to press charges because she didn't want to make a circus of her life in court, and was the bigger person by doing so. I spent the next few months in fear that her allegation would have me discharged from the army and my image forever tarnished, but nothing ever happened. The Revenge Five months afterward, Kate DM'd me. After pleasantries, 
She basically apologized for the whole thing and actually admitted to faking it. Though she would never publicly admit it to save her own reputation, my image be damned. This angered me, but I kept cool. I screech out the texts and continue talking with her. Over the next three months, she entered into a cycle of events as follows. Complain about his current life situation, usually about John screwing up in the relationship in one way or another, and asking for advice. Lamenting our relationship, how I never screwed up like John did, how she wished we could go back to the way things were, blah blah blah. Ignoring me because John finally pulled his head out of his ass, did some huge romantic gesture, and saved the relationship. Going on a smear campaign on social media about our relationship, employing her friends for help, knowing in full that I would see it all, and trying to bait me into an argument. It would work. She would try to turn the argument around and paint me as the bad guy, and then block me for about a month before repeating the cycle. This happened three times, like clockwork, and always left me burnt out and broken. But a part of me wanted it to happen. Each time it did, I took screenshots of every damning thing she said. I had a full SD card of everything I compiled before I finally decided it was time. Making several pictured copies of the worst of the worst text messages I caught, I bought several manila envelopes and mailed them to everyone I thought would matter to Kate. Her parents, grandparents, extended family she was super close with, best friends, work boss, co-workers, teachers, whoever I could find a mailing address for. I made sure that anyone getting the envelope would know that the texts were between me and Kate and sent them off. Within three weeks, I got results. Some of the people who messaged me to shame and insult me before now apologize for their words. My favor was from her own parents, who went on to say that they were deeply sorry about their daughter's behavior, how they raised her to be better than how she acted, and to please not pursue any legal actions. The thought had crossed my mind, but I didn't have the money nor the mental fortitude to fight a legal battle. I told them I'd think about it, and that they'd be the first to know besides Kate if I did. Kate sent me some texts as well, with things like, How could you betray my trust like that? Or, You ruined my life, you bastard. I didn't reply. I just read every angry text that flew in with a satisfied grin, and then blocked her when they stopped. I never fully found out how badly her life was affected by my revenge, but I do know that she dropped out of school and no longer has a job. I hope John was worth that. Hey original poster, this is such a hectic story and it really sucks that you had to go through the stress of her cheating and lies. I commend you for powering through the situation and keeping your cool while collecting the evidence to strike back. Our next story comes from the user, just wait it gets better. That's a dumb freshman. I rushed into a relationship with a freshman girl who lived right above me. We'll call her Megan. It was convenient for me to date someone who lived so close, but everyone else in her building hated Megan because she talked a lot and almost exclusively about herself. She bragged often about being a fairly aggressive person, but somehow I overlooked that mile-wide red flag. Right after Thanksgiving break, at the end of an evening class, I got a call from my mom who noticed some unusual activity on my checking account. Back then I had no credit card, so this account, slash debit card, was my only access to my savings while I lived on campus. I rarely needed to buy anything during the semester, so I was puzzled to find that $104.29 had left my bank account over two weeks, in the form of six Grubhub food orders. At this point, I trusted Megan, but I decided to ask her about the money right away. She denied any involvement and suggested that I cancel my debit card. After a really long phone call to the bank, I did just that. Next, I reached out to Grub Home Customer Service on Twitter. Hey, my car was stolen and used for food orders on these dates. Can I have the receipts? They sent me the first and last receipts, but they had to redact the personal info of the account holder. I say redact in quotes because they just used the Snapchat draw tool, and Megan's name was clearly visible on both receipts. What's more, the most recent receipt was only two hours old. She was probably still eating when I chopped up my debit card. It's worth noting that she and I both had unlimited dining plans, paid for by our respective parents, and we lived 500 feet from the nearest dining hall. She didn't need to order food, and she definitely didn't need my money to do it. So I tested her again. I have the receipts from Grubbub. Are you sure you didn't make those orders? I reply. Thank you for suspecting me. Fairly aggressive, wouldn't you say? I hatched a plan to collect security camera footage of her picking up the order from that evening. However, by midnight, Megan arrived at my door in tears and confessed to everything. Plus, she admitted to being a serial shoplifter. Exhausted, I sent her away and decided to deal with everything in the morning. By the next day, everyone in her building seemed to know what was going down, probably because Megan had already begun broadcasting her version of the story. I sent Megan a breakup text and decided that $104.29 was a loss, 
At least I escaped unscathed, right? Well, less than two days later, she entered my room when I wasn't looking. I was sitting at my desk when I noticed her standing silently behind me. Megan, give me my stuff. Where's my stuff? Me. What stuff? Megan, you know. I did not know. She tore through the room, looking for something that she refused to identify. Just as quickly as she came, she was gone, and I locked the door because obviously this wasn't over yet. Within a minute, she was back. She stood outside my door, knocking and demanding a letter back inside. The knocking quickly got more violent. She started shouting, I know you're f in there, and open the mother f door. Mind that we lived in this building with students in our program who all know each other, and all of them could hear her. Pretty quickly, Megan was rattling the handle of my door. Next, she began throwing herself at it, shoulder first, trying to break it down. I live next door to my RA, but judging by the lack of any intervention, he was elsewhere. So I whipped out my phone and texted him to send backup. Meanwhile, I saw my heavy wooden door bending and buckling. I even heard it crack a bit. My RA was on duty in another building, so he sent three of his colleagues to de-escalate the situation. They brought Megan downstairs, where she revealed that the stuff she wanted was just the t-shirt and keychain that she gave me for my birthday. Whatever, I let her have those. I still just wanted this to be over. However, once I shared my story with the resident life staff, they file university paperwork to place a no-contact order between me and Megan. They also recommended I contact a Canvas police, who then told me I should get my stolen money back in small claims court. I could even get there without a car or money to pay for an Uber. Sorry, Judge Shooty. At the request of the campus police, I also contacted the Title IX office at my school, sending them the story of everything you've read so far. They were interested, to say the least, although I didn't want any trouble. I just wanted a clean breakup and a fresh start, but a Title IX representative informed me that they were bringing free misconduct charges against Megan. Theft, threatening violent behavior, and inciting an intervention by university staff. The representative asked me to serve as a witness in Megan's disciplinary hearing the next semester. I tentatively agreed, right before the representative set the hearing date for February 14th. Valentine's Day. I thought it was a joke, but they really did that. When the day of the hearing finally arrived, the no conduct order was still in effect. But a few of my friends had kept tabs on Megan. For starters, she failed all of her classes in the fall. Someone in my math course confessed that Megan had tried to sleep with him while she was dating me. Eddie had to repeatedly tell her no. Even worse, Megan kept telling a twisted version of the whole story to try to turn my friends against me. So, when I found out that she had found a new boyfriend, it felt good to know that the V-Day disciplinary hearing ruined whatever evening plans they might have made. I arrived alone at the disciplinary board office, unsure what to expect. The board consisted of grad students, and the hearing was expected to run into the night. Unlike me, Megan did not come alone. She brought both of her parents as character witnesses. That wasn't even a thing here. This wasn't a real courtroom, as you'll soon see. And that's not all. Megan's parents also paid a lawyer to defend her against the charges. The board knew that was unnecessary, but Megan's parents believed so strongly in their daughter's innocence that they had already paid this three-piece suit to make her case. In the name of fairness, the board members offered me pro bono legal representation, a junior economics major who will call Jimmy. Jimmy had already read my account of the events from the fall, and thanks to my screenshots and Grubbub receipts, he said there was an okay shot of the charges sticking. Then I told him something I'd kept secret for months. When Megan tried to break down my door and I whipped out my phone to text my RA, I also filmed the whole thing. Jimmy couldn't get enough of the video. There was Megan, kicking and screaming and clearly trying to break into my dorm room. It was all the evidence I needed, and no one saw it coming. In the hearing, when the time came for me to tape the case against Megan, Jimmy played the video on a big screen in front of everyone. The room went insane. In that instant, I realized that Megan really had convinced everyone I was a liar. In her version of the story, I gave her permission to buy food using my account. She told her parents that she'd asked me politely for her belongings, which I'd rudely hidden from her in my dorm room. In Megan's story, I was the sociopath trying to ruin her reputation. Before I unveiled the video, it was her word against mine. I still didn't want revenge, even after finding out that Megan tried to cheat on me. But when I saw her parents flipping out at the video, why didn't you tell us you did this? And her lawyer raising hell. This evidence was not provided in pretrial disclosure. And a board member standing over him, sir, this is not a court of law. Please return to your seat. And him shouting, objection. And her reply, we don't have objections. This isn't a court of law. And Jimmy, my new best friend, just trying not to laugh out loud. 
That's when I realized how good revenge can feel when it's fair and deserved. The board found Megan responsible on all three charges. My side of the bench recommended the university terminate her housing contract and force her to pay restitution. Her side recommended only restitution and a reprimand. The board compromised. Her family paid back most of the money she stole. Most, because two of the six orders had the same price and the lawyer convinced the board I had duplicated an order. And Megan was forced to move into a different dorm building. This probably would have helped her anyway, because every student in our program's building knew everything she'd done and lied about. They wouldn't speak to her, and no one wanted to be her roommate. By the time she had to move buildings, she'd already failed all of her courses again. Having paid for her tuition, her unused dining plan, her lawyer, and her restitution, Megan's parents finally pulled her out of school. Where are they now? Last I heard, Megan returned as a part-time student. But I never saw her again, because the no-contact order still stands. I'm now Facebook friends with the guy Megan tried to seduce. Oh, and Jim and I connected on LinkedIn. As for me, well, I no longer date fairly aggressive people. <laughs> wow. First she steals original poster's money for literally no reason because they had full dining accounts, and then attempts to cheat on him. It's clear this girl didn't care about our original poster. While the punishment she is facing is pretty extreme, she brought it upon herself, and revenge was necessary. Good job, necessary.